There we go. All right. So I got the recording started. Um, so for this class, you know, we are ahead of Monday and Wednesday class. Yesterday, I mean, last time, we talked about several components in the processor. And let us go back and talk about the main uh, components we have already talked about. I think in this class, I have not yet talked about the RAM components. So that's going to be the next thing. And the best way to talk about that is to use logic sim. So uh, you don't have to use logic sim like right in the class to make it kind of flexible. You can kind of focus on the next step and take notes if you want to. Right. So to use logic sim, uh, today we'll focus on how we work with the RAM component as well. It is kind of important to notice you know, because the processor does have to interact a lot with the RAM. RAM is a kind of memory, we don't remember the term RAM. I believe last time we started to talk about this, you know, we have a lot of you know, interchange functions and things like that. So, so today we'll go to the interchange functions and stuff like that. The first thing is, you know, there are two attributes, you know, two really important attributes in RAM. The first one is the address bit width, and the second one is the address bit width. The address bit width determines the number of So with 8 bits, how many locations do you think I can address? Yep, 64. So with 2 to the power of 8, not minus 1, it's actually 2 to the power of 8. So that would be 256. So with 8 bit as an address, I have 256 addressable locations starting from 0000 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 in binary all the way up to 1111 1111 in binary so there are 256 locations that are addressable each location has 8 data bits now these two do not have to be the same so i can change the address bit width to other things while maintaining the data bit width or do it the other way around, or change both at the same time. Is that okay? Does everybody understand you know, what each one of these is determined? One determines how many locations, the other one determines how big is one location. If you have any questions about the address bit width versus the data bit width. Seeing no questions, all right, so we are gonna go ahead and make a 8 bit wide uh, input pin. So this way, you know, we can control you know, the address port. Okay, so we can dictate you know, which location we want to address. And then the next one is what we call the chip select. So SEL is not the same thing as the SEL of a select of a multiplexer, you know, big multiplexer. This one is actually called chip select. It is more common that you see the um, caption of this one is written here. It's CS not just SEL. CS stands for chip select, which basically means this is almost the same thing as EN when we are talking when we were talking about the computer Okay. So the next one is the clock and I'm just gonna use a regular input pin for the clock at this point. The clock is has the same symbol as the one in the register, okay, because it is a little triangle. Next one is called the LD pin. The LD pin determines the direction of the operation because you know, the same device, the RAM device, can be used in the read operation. It can also be used in the write operation. In other words, we can read the content of a specific location, but we can also overwrite or change the content of a specific, specific location. The next one is CLR, which stands for clear, but it is the same, uh, it serves the same function as the pin that is labeled zero in register, because you know, as soon as this you know, pin becomes a one, every single byte in this particular RAM com uh, component all turns to zero. Okay, now they're all zeros to begin with, so it's not gonna be obvious. And then the last one is the data port, which I'll leave unconnected at this point, okay? Because you know, how we connect to the data point, the data port, um, kind of depends on what operation you're talking about. What 
next thing I can always do is to just you know, make an alpha pin. <coughs> the alpha pin has to be 8 bit in order to match the data bit width of the RAM. So I can always kind of do this and then just OK. Because you know, the, the, data, uh, the alpha pin is not going to try to put some content on this particular data. All right, so now we have the RAM component. And once again, I need to kind of make sure that everyone can understand that if you want to get a written description of the RAM component, you can go to the library for these records, and they will be in the You can also get a different thing if you wish. Here, <coughs> you go to the memory library, and then you go to RAM, it will give you exactly the same description that we have talked about. So that's a really good thing. Okay, so there we go. All right. So the first thing we want to do is to plan a few uh, specific bytes into the contents of the RAM. We can use the poking tool to do that. So whatever location you poke, like this one here, you can say, oh, I want to change this content to whatever. You just type on the keyboard. At the, the uh, digits that you type are going to be hexadecimal, which means you know, they range from 0 to 9 and then A to F, because they are base 16 numbers, okay, 16 digits. So I'm going to specify this location to have the content of 8A, uh, this one is 1E, this one is you know, 2F, and so on. But you can see that you know there are only 16 locations displayed on the screen. What if I want to change something in the display? The answer to that question is right-click on the RAM component and then go to Edit Content. Then it will show you the hexadecimal editor looks like this. So the way we read this particular you know, editor is everything to the left hand side, these are the addresses of the first location or the first uh, location on the board. So that means this particular location here has the address of not 90 but 90. In other words, these addresses are also in hexadecimal. Everything is in hexadecimal. So let's check out you know, whether you guys know how to read the addresses. So can someone tell me what is the address of the bytes that I have read here, that I, that I have done my reading? So what would be the address of that one byte? You can count from the left to right, and you can also count from the right to left. Counting from the left to right is the same as that. Counting from the right to left is exactly the same. So this location is going to be B, B, B. The other way to count is you can count from left to right. So that's A0, B0, B9, B7, B8, B9, and BA. <coughs> so uh, getting used to hexadecimal counting is going to be quite helpful. Not only for this class, okay, because if you want to do anything that involves you know, programming or specification, hexadecimal counting is very useful for many things. All right, very good. So let's go ahead and change this one too. So location DB is going to have a content of, I'm just going to overwrite it. Uh, I'll say something like D5, okay? All right. So now that I have the different pages, let's go ahead. Go ahead and try to specify the speed of content. In other words, let's just say that we want to read from this location and change the speed of content. <laughs> well, there's no sense. Because if it's at location DB, the input A pin or the A port is also specified 80 because that's how you specify which location you want to read from. So we want DB to be here, and D is 1. It 
operation specifies that LC is public. So in LC is one, it cannot be separated from LC. Okay. Okay. This does this. Quality is not going to be. Oh, this is not good. The building mic is. Noisy. It's not. I don't think it's very. It is pretty clear my voice, but it's not going to be a very good signal. Test. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. So here we go. We are continuing with the lecture. It is still being recorded. Okay. That's good. All right. So getting back to here, I apologize for the uh, distraction. All right. So now we can try to specify a write operation. In other words, we want to change the content of a location. So let's just say that we want to change the location of this byte over here, which has the address of D 
uh, 3 because this is D0, this is D1, D2, this is D3. So we'll turn off the chip first, okay? Because when we're making changes, it's good to turn off the chip before we are you know, uh, done with reconfiguring all the pins. Because this is going to be a right operation, the LD pin needs to be a 0 instead of a 1, so we change that. Um, the address needs to be D3, so we are changing this to D3 like so. 1101 is still specifying D. 0011 is specifying 3, so we have D3. So at this point, we can enable the chip. Okay, so we have now enabled the chip. You can see that the location is selected. In other words, the chip now says, okay, I know we are supposed to be overwriting this location with something. So I'm highlighting which location that we are we have selected or we have addressed. But what am I what what are we going to overwrite it with? Okay, that's the next question. So in this case we go like, oh, okay. We don't have any way to convey that we want to overwrite this location with, let's say, you know, A5 as a, as a value, because this is an output pin. It's not an input pin. Okay, well, we can solve that problem by making another input pin that is a bit wide and connect that input pin to the same node over here. So now we can use this input pin to specify the value that we want to use to overwrite the selected location. So we'll go ahead and specify this as A5. A is 1010, 5 is 0101. Okay, so now we have this all done. And just like a register, having the chip or the RAM selected or enabled is not going to do a single thing when you want to override the, the content because what you need is also a rising edge at the clock. The clock is currently a zero. So as soon as I turn it into a one, then we have a rising edge. And as a result, you know, the content of the D port should go into the location that we have selected using the A port. So that's what we're gonna do next, is to give it a rising edge. And sure enough, that location, the content at location D3 is now changed to A5 according to the input pin. So you go like, okay, so we have fixed all the problems, right? So let's go back and try to read another location. Okay, so this time we'll try to read some of the earlier locations that we have changed already. So let me see if which one uh, I can read. Let's go ahead and read this one over here. Okay, we want to read back the one E. The question is, what is the address of that byte? Can somebody tell me? You can count forward, you can count backward. If you count backwards, the last location is an F. So we just have to kind of go backwards. A, so let's check it. This is F, E, D, C, B, A. That is correct. So that location is 0A in terms of the address. So let's go ahead and close this. And we need to specify 0A in the address. So 0 is easy. And then A is 1010, zero, zero, like that. And you can see, you know, oh, okay, we are, we are right there already, okay? And I forgot a few things. I forgot to turn off the chip first, okay? So we have to turn off the chip be, you know, as we do this. <clears throat> and then we specify this is a read operation. So LD needs to be a one. And we don't really care about the clock because when you're reading, you know, the clock doesn't really do a single thing. So now it is time to finally turn on the select, the chip select, and then we'll see that, oh, we have a problem. Hmm, we have a problem. How do we know there's a problem? Red is not here, right? Okay, so we have a problem. <clears throat> so what is the problem? So the problem seems like, hmm, only certain bits has a problem and other bits do not have a problem. So this particular bit here, it's still a zero, it is not an E, which stands for error. This one is still a one, it is not an error. So why is that the case? Well, it has to do with, we have two sources of specifying a single bit in this case. The input pin is trying to specify 10100101 because I haven't changed that. So if you look at the input pin, 10100101, eh, it's not a problem. 
But when we, when we look at this read operation, the RAM chip, the RAM component, is also trying to specify 00011110 to the D port, which connects to exactly the same node. <coughs> so let's t try to take a look at what the D port is trying to output. It is a 0, 0, 0, 0001 for the 1, and then a 1110 for the D. They go like, oh, look at this. This bit here is consistent. They're both trying to specify a zero. This bit here is also consistent. They're both trying to specify a one in this case. And that's why those bit positions do not have an error. Because you know, the two sources are agreeing on, oh, we want to specify a zero, or we want to specify a one for that specific wire. Are we doing OK so far with that concept? But what about the rest? Well, the rest, we have a problem. Because with bit seven, one is trying to specify a one, the other one is try to, trying to specify a zero, and you know, the same thing for bit five, four, three, and then one and zero. So all of those bits have disagreement, okay? The input pin from somewhere else is trying to specify a value that is different from what the D port is trying to specify. So we have a problem. So the problem has to do with this. The problem has to do with, in a read operation, we really should not be connecting an input pin to the D port, because the D port should be the only thing trying to specify the value on this node. Is that okay? Is that concept okay? Because in a read operation, the D port acts as an output, so I should not have a, another thing trying to specify the value on this node which was useful when we were trying to specify a write operation, because in the write operation, the D port was acting as an input. So somebody else has to specify a value so that I can change the location of RAM, change the content of a location in RAM. So that means this connection here is sometimes we want it and sometimes we don't want it. So now the question is, how can we do something like that? Now, the easy thing to do when you are you know, in control of the circuit is simply to say, eh, easy fix. But you cannot do that when a processor is running. You cannot just go in and cut out a section of the circuit when it is um, a, write oper a read operation and then put that you know, connection back when it's a read operation. You just cannot do it that way, okay? So what we need in this case is a component that is called a, um, controlled buffer. It is under gates. And over here, it is called a controlled buffer. It looks like this. So what exactly is a controlled buffer? Well, a controlled buffer has three terminals. This terminal is the input. This terminal is the output. This terminal is the enable. So when it is disabled, then the output is floating. If it is enabled, then it will try to mirror whatever the input has to the output. Is that okay? Let me say that one more time. There's the input, there's the output. When the component is disabled, the output is floating. We explained that term on last Thursday. Okay? Floating means it is not trying to specify any value to the node that is connected to it. When the device is enabled, then what it wants to do is to read the input and then mirror the input to specify the output. Are we okay with that concept? Okay. So if we're okay with that concept, then we can try to incorporate this device into this whole thing. So if you want it to make, do, if you want to make it look nice, you can kind of do that, um, and I can make it look even slightly better, like so. So we're gonna put it right about here. Okay, so now we have a connection from here to here. Oh, right, I forgot to change the number of data bits. So it has to match, there we go. And then we go connect from here to here. So what do you think should dictate whether it should be driving the output or not? Load is related to it, but I cannot just connect it to load because if this wire, if the enable of the control buffer is connected directly to load, that means it's going to enable right now, which is not what we want to do. We want to disable it right now. So that means you know, the 
the load signal, which is a one when we are reading, needs to be negated first. Well, that's not too hard to do. We just pick up a NOT gate, stash it about here, so that we negate the load pin before it becomes the control the, or this uh, enable, enable um, a signal to the control buffer. So now everything works. So I'm just going to pause here and see if there are any questions about the use of a control buffer so that we can use basically the same circuit for both read operation when the control buffer is off, okay, so that only the output pin is reflecting what the data port of the RAM is outputting. And when we need a write operation, then the input pin is then connected to the data port because at that point, the data port or the D port of RAM is acting as an input, so it's okay to do it that way. So we're doing okay so far with this. Yes? It's called a controlled buffer. This component is called a controlled buffer. Okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Many years ago, you know, I used to explain this concept and just say, oh, this is the clutch. Okay? <laughs> yep. Then I realized, you know, like 98% of my class does not drive a manual or a stick shift car, so that analogy doesn't quite work, you know, you know, as time goes on. So these days I try to refrain from using the term clutch. <clears throat> All right. So now we have, you know, the yes. Um, well, let's go ahead and go to the library reference and go to the gates and then we go to the control buffer and see how it is explained. Okay, so the control buffer can be, invert, can be inverted. We have one that is not inverted. Um, when the value of, on this pin is, a, okay, so the control pin, okay, so the value of the control pin, which is the one you know, here or here, but we are, since we're only using this one, it is this particular pin. When, when the value of this pin is a one, then the component behaves just like the respective component, which is a buffer. A buffer is basically just you know, an echo thing or a loudspeaker. It takes whatever is the input and mirror that you know, to the output. When the value is zero, then the component output is, also, is floating. So you know, the whole, um, so now the concept is, do we remember what floating means from the lecture from last Thursday? So does that explain it? Okay, another way to look at this, okay, I know this is also an, an analogy that is mechanical, is to think about the RAM component as a Jeep that is being, as a Jeep, okay, like a car, okay? But it's stick shift. So when you are towing a Jeep behind a RV, a recreational vehicle, do you want the clutch, do you want it to be in neutral, or do you want the gearbox to be engaged? You want it to be neutral or not engaged because otherwise you're gonna wreck the engine depending on which gear you're in. Some people tow a car behind in first gear and not realize that. <laughs> so, yeah, so basically you're turning, so you can turn the, uh, the gearbox into neutral by saying this able here, okay? In other words, this thing, when it is like this, when there's a dark green, it is putting your gearbox to neutral so you can push it around. Is that okay? When this is a one, then the gearbox is engaged, okay? You can think of it as in, in the lowest possible gear. So if your gearbox is in the lowest possible gear, you cannot push it around because you know, the engine is engaged you know, to the wheel. So you know, this way, you, know, you just cannot push it around. Does that make sense? Because, say again? So you can't still use the D part of your RAM? Mm -hmm. Only if you have one output, which is probably using a buffer, right? 
Well, the D port is an output when you're reading. It is an input when you are writing. So that's the, that's the issue is sometimes we want the input pin to be connected when we are writing, and other times we want the input pin not to be connected because we are reading. So when you're reading, you can think of it as, let's see. So when you are reading, the data port has its own thing to output. So you, you want this thing to be disengaged so that it, there's no chance that it, they can be fighting. OK? All right. It's like viewing versus editing. Huh? It's like viewing something versus editing. Yes, exactly. So when we are reading, we are viewing, and if uh, and that's when the LD pin is a one. But when we are writing, we are editing, which means when the LD pin is a, is a zero. All right. So, are there any additional questions about how the RAM component works? No questions. All right. Well, I'm, I've been waiting for this moment you know, for a few weeks because now we can actually talk about coding, okay? So we're gonna do some fancy coding now. So we'll go to the processor <laughs> and then we'll do some coding. So the coding is actually pretty easy. We actually let the um, RAM component to be to re to remain as all zeros, okay. In other words, we're not exactly coding. We are just you know leaving the program as all no op operations, N O P no op, which means it doesn't do a single thing, okay. But we want to find out how it is doing not a single thing. So that kind of statement can only come from me, okay. Let me re let me repeat that statement. Let us figure out how the processor is doing nothing, okay? So there's still doing, except it's doing nothing. Well, it's doing nothing in the sense that it's not changing any one of the software accessible registers, it's not changing any location in RAM, but nonetheless, it is executing instructions. So that's why I said we are now investigating how the processor is doing nothing, and it's, it's actually important. So the processor, if I zoom out a little bit, is really, well, I wouldn't say really complex, but it is a mess, okay? There are a lot of components. So the question is, where do we start, okay? So I'm giving you guys some pointers here. You might want to write it down, okay? So all the, the entire process that I'm going through right now is actually important, and I'm making sure the mic is picking up my voice, okay? It's not gonna be the cleanest you know, signal, but it is still working. So the first thing we do is we start at the lower portion here. This is this part here is called the controller of the processor. In other words, it is actually the one part that dictates how the rest of the processor is gonna get things done. Okay, so we're gonna start with that. Um, in fact, I'm going to write it down using Joplin, so this way you know, I can share my notes with you guys too. And you can compare my notes with your notes at the end of today's class and see if you have captured you know, the important part of the information. So let's do that. And this is CISP 310. And this is section 10899, like a new note. Today is 2024, 10, 8. There we go. All right. So I'm prepared to take some notes, and you should probably do some note taking as well, okay? Because this is good practice, okay? Because I'm doing mine. You can double check and see if yours is matching up. So the first thing we do, okay, when we are trying to track down what the processor is doing, the first component is the microcode portion, the UCODE PTR, okay? So I'm just gonna write down my mind, UCODE PTR is the first component to look at. Okay, so you don't call this U code PTR. This is actually the abbreviation of micro because you know, in um, measurement of, in unit measurement, 
uh, micro, which is you know, 10 to the power of negative six, okay, this is a micro, is also known as mu, okay, the Greek letter mu is used to represent 10 to the power of negative six, and that's why we have micrometer, otherwise known as a micron, okay, uh, we have microgram, okay, when you're trying to measure, you know, certain types of uh, chemical in food, it's a microgram, which is, you know, one millionth of a gram. So that's micro. But micro or mu is difficult to type, you know, in you know, normal text. So as a result, most of the time people just use the uh, English letter U to represent your know, mu, which is representing the same thing, which is micro, okay? So the entire name of this register is microcode pointer. Instead of spelling out pointer, P-O-I-N-T-E-R, I just abbreviate that to P-T-R. Okay, so that's the first component. Okay, so you look at this component, and we are not concerned about what, how it is changed. We're concerned about what is, what is it used? How is it used? Well, it's used in a few ways, okay? So if you use the poking tool, you can see, you can track it down. So the first thing we know is, oh, it goes to an adder. And when you look at the adder, what does it do? It is adding one, okay? There's a one here, this is the one. It's adding one, and then it goes all the way back and potentially be used to update the micro code pointer. But we are not updating the micro code pointer, so that means you know, the path to the adder is not going to be very important for us at this point. So we now track down the other node, or the uh, excuse me, the other port that is connected to the output of the micro code pointer, which is this one over here. What is it? It is the A port of a of a ROM. Okay. So a ROM is basically an initialized array. Okay, that you cannot change the content when you're running the program. So the address port is basically the index into this array. It specifies which element of the array do we want to access. So in this case, because the micro code pointer is 000, which location do you think the ROM is address being addressed at this point? Location 000, okay? So location 000 has this rather long content of 1080007, okay? So it has a lot of bits. If you use the selection tool, you will find that this particular ROM has a rather strange number of bits per location. It has an address bit width of 12, which means it has 4,096 locations, but it also has a rather strange width Per location, it is 26 bit wide. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, so let me just write down here. Okay, so determine which location of the ROM is addressed, and then we want to look at the content or value at this location. Okay. So the value at this location is kind of like, uh, I, don't, I don't know what that means. Well, okay, it's okay not to know what that means, but do we know what the output is connected to? So here comes the really kind of fun part of tracking down things, is um, we kind of need to decide you know, where the, these 26 bits are going to. We know bit zero is going all, folding all the way back here. Um, Bit one is going to RAM cell. Bit two, uh, bit two is going to RAM load. Bit three to twenty three goes to a tunnel called microcode data, and so on and so forth. To track each one down is going to be difficult. I do not recommend you know tracking each and every single one of those bits down. Instead, I'll give you a shortcut of what you can do to analyze what the processor is going to do and how to analyze it. So the next thing we want to do is to find out what things can actually be actively changed or serve an important role. So we'll start with registers. So where are the registers? Now, the, if this is the first time you do this, it's going to be difficult to find the registers. 
This is one register, it's called the program counter. So I'm gonna put it down here, okay? So we want to track down the program counter as a register. And there are a few other registers. This is also a register here, it is called the instruction register. Okay, so right here, um, nope. Just let me point to just the register. Okay, so we have the instruction register. Um, we have the flags register. Okay, so the flags register is right here. So what I'm doing is I'm you know, locating and remembering all the registers that are important. Okay, so there are three registers here, and that's about all the registers that we have. We also have registers inside the register bank. This thing here is called the register bank. So now you know, I'm gonna write down you know, the register bank has its own components inside. So we right click on it and then we go to view reg bank, register bank, and it has four registers labeled A, B, C, D. So I'm gonna write down A, B, C, D inside the register bank. And there's one more component that is actually useful or you know, really quite helpful. So that would be the RAM component. So let me back out of the register bank and you can just double click main you know, to go back to the main circuit. And the RAM component is all the way here. So that's the last thing that we want to kind of track down. So now we have, I'm just gonna put my notes you know, to the projector for a brief moment so that you can see you know, how much note I have taken at this point. There we go, moving here. So this is the note that I have taken so far, you know, which is in order to track down what the processor is doing, start with the micro code pointer, look at the value of the micro code pointer. Because the value of the micro code pointer determines which location of the ROM is being addressed. And that lo the value of that, lo of that location is controlling a bunch of stuff, okay? A lot of multiplexers, a lot of demultiplexers, and blah, 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 okay? So what do we do, okay? There are so many things. Well, we only focus on these things over here. So that means, you know, in the end, okay, this is supposed to be unindented. Let me see if I can unindent, there we go. So in the end, we really only have, what, nine things, or eight things that we really have to track down. The program counter is one, the instruction register is one, the flags register is one, register A, B, C, D are four, and then last of all, we have RAM. Okay, because only these components here can potentially store something or can potentially be changed. The content can be updated to store something else. The rest of the processor is like, oh, if you want me to do this at this particular instant, I can do that, but I have no way to remember things. These are the only eight components that are capable of remembering a value so that later on you can use the value for something else. Okay, so that's why they are of much much greater importance. Are we good so far? Okay. So the next thing, I'm gonna put this back, okay? So I will share this note with you today, okay? But I'm not gonna make this a habit of taking notes of my own lecture. <clears throat> so the next thing we do is to find out which one is quote unquote enabled. In other words, of the eight components that I have just talked about, they can all be enabled, which means they can also be disabled. If it is disabled, I'm not interested, because if it's disabled, that means it's not getting updated. If it's not getting updated, ah, that would not be my first interest, okay? You know, I might be interested in it because of some other reason later on, but that would not be where I start my reasoning. So I'm only f looking for the ones that are enabled. So if I go through that list, the first thing I do is to go to the program counter and see if it is enabled. So let me just do that here. So the program counter is down here. Do you think it is enabled? This is the program counter. Is it enabled? No. It is not enabled because the E end has a dark green line connected to it, which means it is a zero. So if the E end is a zero, it is not enabled means it's not gonna be updated. Is that okay? So we then move on to the next one on the list, and I believe the next one on the list is the instruction register. Aha, 
okay, so the instruction register is enabled because you can see a bright green line connected to the EN or the enable. So now we make a note of it, okay? So I'm gonna write it down here, okay? So in this particular case, the instruction register is enabled, okay? And then, but we want to locate everything that is enabled because it, that would give us a starting point of how to analyze stuff. The third one on the list was the flags register. So now we go to the flags register, which is here. And the flags register is not enabled, so I'm not gonna put it on the list. Is that okay? And then we go to the four registers inside the register bank. You know, they are name, namely, they are registers A to D. So we go to the register bank and we, they are all disabled. We don't see a single bright green line in the entire circuit. So that means they are all disabled. So here we see a certain component that we haven't really talked about before. It is called a decoder. This component is called a decoder. So there's a decoder inside the register bank. Then you guys go like, Tech, did you forget to talk about this? No, I did not actually forget to talk about it. Because a decoder is like a demultiplexer, except the input is a constant one. Let me say that one more time. <coughs> a decoder is like a demultiplexer, which means it has one input, multiple output. But in this case, the input is a constant one. Which means the only thing you can really do about it is one, am I enabling the, dis, uh, the, multi, the demultiplexer? And if I do enable the, the multiplexer, you know, what output should be connected to the input, which is the included one? Those are the only things you can do. So right now you can see it is disabled because you know, this is a zero. And the output is not floating. The output are all zeros in this case because I need to make sure that register A, B, C, and D are disabled for sure because I don't want to leave this node here you know, floating because if, if it's floating, that means depending on whether you're running your microwave and you know, using a hair dryer and shaking your computer in, computer in a certain way, it can flip between the zero and the one randomly, okay? We don't want random stuff happening, so we are just outputting zeros to every single register, the enable of every single register to make sure that nobody is gonna update because I don't want anyone to update at this point. Is that okay? But when you look at this, okay, this enable you know, of the decoder is actually connected to a pin, okay? There's a pin here. So that means if this pin is a zero, we already know that none of the four registers is gonna be enabled. So that means I really did not have to look into the register bank to know that none of the four registers, A, B, C, D, is enabled because this wire on its own is already telling me that none of the four registers in the, in the register bank is gonna update because they're all disabled. Is that okay? Okay. All right, so what is next on the list? The RAM component. So now we slide over to the RAM component, which is this guy here. Is it enabled? Well, it's tricky because the pin is not labeled as EN. It is labeled as SEL, okay? So chip select is the same thing as enable. And it is enabled, okay? You know, because chip select is a one. Okay, so we'll make a note of that too. So I'm making a note that the instruction register and RAM are both enabled, okay? So let me share with you what my note is trying to say at this point, okay? So we identify you know, which ones are enabled. Only these two are en enabled. So what do we do next? Well, the instruction register doesn't have much to analyze because the only thing you can do is update. So we have to start with the RAM. Okay, so if the RAM component is enabled, we got a few questions to ask. So what can RAM do? What are the two operations that a RAM component can perform? Read or write, very good. So we need to kind of determine are we reading or are we writing, okay? So that's what we need to figure out. So which pin of the RAM is going to tell us whether we are reading or writing? The LD pin, the load pin, 
and it is a one at this point, so that means we are reading or writing. Okay, let, let me hover over because you know, that clue is in the, on the screen itself. Load if one. So that means we are, we are reading. Okay, one means it's we, we are reading. Okay, so we go back to the note here. So LD is a one. It means we are reading. Okay, that's good. So if we are reading, that means you know, what, is, what would be the next natural question? What I'm trying to guide you through here is how to ask questions. Okay, how to ask questions step by step as we go through this exercise. So we know RAM is active, it's trying to do something. We know we are reading. So what is the next question? Reading what? Reading what? Very good, okay, so what are we reading? In other words, which location are we reading from? Because remember, this RAM component has 256 locations. When we are reading, we are reading one of the 256 locations. So what part should I take a look next in order to determine which location I'm reading? The address port, okay, the A port, very good. Okay, so I'm writing in my notes, okay? I'm going back to my notes, and where is it? There we go. So I'm putting my notes back to the on the other screen, okay? It's because I'm writing this down, okay? So we are reading. So we now ask, you know, what are we reading? In other words, what is the value of the A port? All right. So we look at the A port. So the concern is not so much of you know, what the value is actually currently, but who is specifying this value, okay? We know it's reading location zero, zero. It's easy because it is highlighted. So the question is not exactly what it is reading. It is who is determining which location we are reading. You might want to write it down, okay? So the question is not so much exactly what location we are reading, but who is telling us where we should be reading in the RAM. I'm writing it down, okay? So try to figure out, figure out who is telling us which location to read, okay? In other words, I'm trying to solve a puzzle, okay? I'm solving the puzzle one step at a time because if we are reading, then we have to ask the follow-up question of um, who's telling us where to read, okay? So we have to track it down. So let's track it down, okay? The highlighted node is you know, the connected to the A port. So now we have to track it backwards and go like, okay, where does it connect to? It connects to this output pin. Can the output pin tell us, you know, de determine, uh, can, can, the, can an output pin be changed to tell us which location we should be reading? Nope, the output pin is the only thing it's good for. It's kind of like a printf statement or C out in C++ programming. It's good for telling us what a value is in a variable or an expression, but you cannot use it to change the value of a variable. So we know this connection here is not gonna answer the question. Ah, but what about this one over here? That's the output of a multiplexer. Is that okay? So what is the follow-up question? Which input? connects to the output, because that's the job of a multiplexer. A multiplexer is the device, is a railroad switch with multiple incoming tracks and only one outgoing track. We know the outgoing track is going to the, the mill, okay? The question is, which train is going to the, to the mill, okay? So what do we need to analyze next in order to determine which of the two inputs is connecting to the output right now? There are only so many ports on the multiplexer in this case. This one is always enabled, so there's no enable pin. So which port should we be analyzing? You can always tell, describe the port by its position. The address. Hmm? The address. The, sorry? The address mux. The address mux, ADDR mux, okay? So you are correct. So ADDR mux, which is this tunnel here, 
is determining which input we should be using to connect to the output. So now the question is, who is determining the value of this particular tunnel? Well, this one comes straight from the, from the raw. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'll write it down first and then we'll track it down. Okay, so we will say that ADDR mux determines which input of the mux connects to RAM.A, which is my abbreviation of A port of RAM. Okay, so how do we know whether a particular tunnel, do you guys remember a tunnel? Did we talk about a tunnel in this class? I think I don't think we did. Okay, so that's my bad because I changed the, I cut out some of the material. So a tunnel, which is this one here, is basically look at this as a portal. Okay, so every tunnel of the same name, they are logically connected. Let me say that one more time. You can have a bazillion tunnels called ADDR mux spelled exactly the same way, case sensitive they are representing exactly the same node. So what that means is I can now design the circuit without running my wire all over the place because this ADDR mux, okay, let me highlight it using the poking tool. So if you highlight a node connected to a tunnel, it will highlight everything that is also logically the same node. So you can see this is basically the same node which are all connected to the node called um, the tunnel called microcode data. So that one is connected here, which means it is coming out of the ROM. Ultimately, what that means is I don't have to track this down any further because ADDR mux is coming from the ROM, which is at location 0, 0, 0 right now. Is that okay? So when you determine something is coming out of the ROM, you can stop because you know, that simply is how the thing is programmed to do. There's no further explanation beyond that. Is that okay? All right. So I'm going to write that down too. Okay. So ADDR mux comes from the ROM. Okay. And that basically concludes it. It is a one. Okay. So let me go back to ADDR mux has a value of one. So can someone tell me which of the input of the multiplexer is connected to the output of the multiplexer. In other words, what ultimately is driving this node here? It's, okay, I see some gesture, okay? It is the lower input that is driving the output, okay? So it is really helpful when you're in Logisim and turn it into the poking, use the poking tool, because every time you poke a single wire, it highlights the entire node, which means everything that connects logically or connected will be highlighted. It makes it a lot easier to track down things. Okay, so it connects to a few things. Once, you know, the first thing is, oh, it connects to an output pin. Once again, an output pin doesn't do much other than acting like a C out, okay? It just reflects the value of that node. Okay, not useful. Um, this is an input port to an adder. It cannot drive, it cannot determine the value of a node either. The only thing that, that can determine the value is this output from the program counter. Is that okay? So after all this, we finally tracked down that the program counter was important after all because the program counter is specifying what location we should be reading from. Okay, so fine, you know, I'm gonna go back to my notes here and then say, um, we track the um, input of RAM.A to PC.Q because you know, that's the output, okay? So I'm gonna use an abbreviation here, RAM.A is PC, PC is driving it. So that's my notes, okay? I will share with you in just a little bit. All right, so that answers one mystery regarding the RAM component. In other words, we finally tracked down this connection all the way to the program counter, which is abbreviated as PC. Well, that answers one question. There's no further question to ask about the program counter because the program counter as a register is always outputting its content. 
There's nothing that can control it to say, oh, I don't want you to output the content. It's always outputting. Okay? So that's going to be one terminal that we can say, OK, we are done with that. But that should be a follow-up question. We are reading from RAM, right? We have determined which location we are reading and who is determining that, who is determining that location. But that should be a follow-up question. Because if you think about all the ports of the RAM, we just explained this one. Uh, this one comes from the ROM. This one comes from the clock, you know, which we don't really care at this point. And then this one also comes from ROM because we can do the analysis th that we just talked about. It comes straight from the ROM. This is also coming from the ROM and also the button. We don't want to hit that button, okay? Because it, otherwise we clear the entire content of the entire ROM. Um, we have not really talked about this one. Should, what questions should we ask about the V port? Because this is a read operation. The V port is acting as an output because whatever content is at location zero, zero is now presented to the V port. So what question should we be asking? Where is it going? Where is it going? Exactly. Who is reading the location that is pointed to by the program calendar? Is that okay? I'm gonna write it down. So these are the things that I think are important. Okay, so the next question that we are asking is um, who is reading the output of RAM, which is RAM.D, okay? That's the next question to ask. So that means every time you see something that is active, enabled, you have to, act, you have to basically ask these questions, okay, the relevant questions. Okay, well, it goes to a lot of places, okay? So look at this highlighted note here. It goes to a bunch of places. So we'll go through all of those places and ask, um, is that important, okay? So we go to this one here. This is a demultiplexer, but a demultiplexer is outputting something when it is enabled. Is this demultiplexer enabled? It is not enabled, so that means, uh, okay, that's a dead end. Okay, you know, we are done with that analysis. So we're gonna tr follow this wire here, the top one, and then it goes all the way to both of these are inputs because both of these are multiplexers. So once again, the input of a multiplexer cannot determine, well, they can be useful in this case because you know, we are trying to see who is reading. So we'll go ahead and track it down. This uh, multiplexer, ultimately connects to the register bank, and we know the register bank is not enabled, which means none of the four registers are getting updated. So that means, uh, that's a dead end. So we follow this one all the way down here, which ultimately may make its way to the program counter. Because you know, this is the multiplexer, the output of this multiplexer connects to this multiplexer, and then it ultimately connects to the program counter, potentially, right? But the program counter is not enabled. So that means uh, this is another dead end. It doesn't really matter in this case. We got one more, okay? So if you look at this one here, it does go to the instruction register. The input, the D part of the instruction register, and the, imp in the instruction register is, is it enabled or not? It is enabled, okay? So when the instruction register, when the register is enabled, uh, what can it potentially do? It can update, right? So that means the instruction register is using the output of RAM, the D port of RAM, to update itself. Is that okay? So now we write it down, okay? So I just write down here, um, the instruction register connects to RAM.D and it is enabled. So that means you know, the instruction register, which I call IR, is going to update to the RAM location that we have selected. And the RAM location is dictated by the program counter. So the notation that I use here, I want to share this with you. So the notation that I use is like this. I used to have a Bluetooth keyboard, which is kind of cool because I can just walk around and still be able to operate and I don't have to walk all the way back here, but that's okay. Walking is good. 
unless you have gout. That is in the codes, but right now. So this is the notation that I used. The instruction register is updated by the location in the RAM dictated by the program model. That is my shorthand of indicating how, what is updated and how it is updated. The alternative of this notation may be a little bit more confusing, but it is actually more relevant. So let me put this in, um, in, a, in, in a inline code block. So the other way to say this is this. So you can focus on the right hand side. So the second way to say the same thing is IR is getting whatever the program counter is pointing to, because after all, the indexing is into memory. Is that OK? OK, I see a lot of nods. Because ultimately, this is really asking, do you remember what the asterisk means in the context of a pointer? The program counter is acting as a pointer. It is pointing to a location in RAM. And we are reading that location. Whatever that location has, the value of that location is used to update the instruction register, which I abbreviate to IR in this case. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So this particular phase, okay, this phase is called the fetch cycle. So you might want to write it down because the word fetch is actually quite important when we are trying to understand how a processor works. All right. So I'm going to pause a little bit here, OK? And you guys are thinking, but Tech, you know your way around the processor because you designed it. So you naturally know where the registers are. But if I were to do this, it's going to take me a lot longer. Well, that is only partially true. Because what you can do is um, to get to this particular file, I will show you guys how to get there. Today's lab actually does not depend on this, OK? So that means you have some time to study this before the lab actually depends on this, okay? So I would use that time. So once you have this you know, processor, the first thing I would do if I were you, you know, to try to get familiarized with this, is to print it, okay? So you can go ahead and print it. That's one way to do it. You can also, if you are one of those people who like to kind of digitally you know, do something, you can also export the circuit as an image. So do whatever you want, okay? And then you highlight the things that we need to go through. In other words, okay, based on my own notes here, you are going to use a little highlighter. And if you want to color code all that stuff, even better. But what you're going to highlight is the register called the program counter, the register that is called the instruction register, the flags register. I would say at this point of time, just highlight the entire register bank. Okay, just see as one single thing and not to see as four different things, and then highlight the RAM. In other words, there are five items that you need to highlight, okay? I think you guys can all manage that. In fact, if you have younger siblings, you know, just tell your younger sibling, you know, like, look for this name and use a crayon and, 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 and fill it in that color, okay? That would be kind of a little fun activity, keep the young person occupied for what? Two minutes. <laughs> but that's important, okay? Because you know, when you have this new picture with all these active components highlighted, the next time you need to do the analysis, it's going to be a lot faster because you don't have to look at the whole thing and go like, oh, I don't know what to start, where to start. No, you know exactly where to start. There are only five things that can potentially do something. Start with those five things. Is that okay? All right, cool. So that means whatever is in at location zero, zero, which turns out to be zero, zero at this point, is going to be used to update the instruction register, which already has the value of zero, zero. So when I do the uh, clock, you know, um, cycle the clock, you can type control T to change the state of the clock you know, by one, or you know, I wouldn't do you know, tick enable because it would just keep going. So I'm just gonna say tick once. So now the clock is a one, 
and the instruction register is quote unquote updated to zero zero because it was zero zero already. So now we have a um, one to zero transition. Every register is only sensitive to a rising edge of the clock except for one register. The one single register that is sensitive to a falling edge is the microcode pointer. I'm gonna write it down. <laughs> okay, so I'll write it down and go like, um, oh, okay, it's on here. So I'm gonna scroll all the way to the bottom here and say, on a falling edge, the microcode pointer updates. And this is the only register that updates on a falling edge. So falling edge. There we go, because that's actually important. It is a register after all, and if it is a register, it is it can be updated. Okay, so now we look at the micro code pointer, and then we're asking, uh, how are you gonna be updated? So what do we do when we try to figure out how the micro code pointer is going to be updated? Which port of the register am I going to track? The D port, very good. Okay, the D port is the input, so that's the one that we need to track down. The D port comes from a multiplexer, it's like, ugh. That, that, then what do we do? What is the next question? We look at the multiplexer, which, por which port of the multiplexer? Am I going to look at next? The gray dot, the select port, okay? Because the select port tells me which of the input connects to the output, all right? So it is a bright green, which is, which is a one, so that means input one of the multiplexer connects to the output of the multiplexer, which is then used to update the micro code pointer. So now we track down input one of the multiplexer, it goes all the way around, and it is the output of the adder. Is that okay? And what are we adding with this adder? If we are adding a K0 of 1, a, the in, one of the input is the current value of the micro code pointer, the other input is a 0. In other words, we're just adding 1 to the current value of the micro code pointer. So that means this wire is micro code pointer plus one, and we are using it to update the micro code pointer, which means what are we doing with the falling edge? We're just incrementing the micro code pointer. That's all we are doing. So I'm gonna write it down too, okay? So now we are update or the micro code pointer, U code PPR, plus plus, okay, because that's all we're doing. We are just incrementing the micro code pointer. All right, so I'm going to stop right here, okay? Yeah, so next time, I'm not gonna explain the operation of the processor with this kind of detail, at least up to this point, okay? So that means you, know, you kind of need to go through this, go through your notes, okay, and make sure that you understand what we have been doing up to this point. This is the end of the fetch operation, okay? So that the next cycle is called decode, but I'll explain it in the next class, okay? But I need to let you know how to find this file, okay? So let me minimize all this stuff here. So the quickest way to find the, mic the, the processor files is to go to course information, go to shared folder. So I'm gonna open up in a new tab. When you get to the shared folder, you go to processor. Okay, so there's a sub there's a subfolder called processor. Okay, you can write it down. Okay, if you're interested, or you can just kind of jot down the time of the lecture. You know, so this way you can look it up in the recording. You go to processor. So this part gets a little bit complicated because there are three files that you need to download. Um, the first one is alu.circ. The second one is regbank.circ. You know, 
and then also the processor 0004.circ. So there are three files that you need to download. Once again, you have ALU, you have processor 0004 because this is the fourth revi revision of the processor, and regbank. So those are the files that you need to download. You can multi-select by control clicking you know, in um, Google Drive, and then you have a right click, and you just say download. I can actually upload this in zip file if you guys want me to. So that way it's easier. You just go to the announcement and you check your announcement. So I would call this processor 0004.zip and I will put it into the announcement. But if you cannot wait for the announcement, you can actually do that yourself. I would put it on a thumb drive along with Logisim because this is what you're gonna be using for the rest of this entire semester. Might as well put it on the thumb drive if you're using one of the computers in the lab. If you're using your own computer, just you know, stash it in a folder that you have and you'll be fine. So are we doing okay so far? Okay, excellent. So what we are doing today in the lab is actually not exactly related to the processor. It is still, we are still on components of the processor at this point. So today's lab is called More Processor Components. I'm unhiding it right now. And the access code is lowercase ttp. I'm gonna write it on the board. TTP all lowercase, which stands for Tax Toy Processor. I'm not kidding you. That is why it is called the TTP. It is Tax Toy Processor. All right, so you can get started with your lab right now, and I'm gonna finish up the recording and then upload it. Um, so today's lecture is, and also today's note too, you know, I'm gonna uh, go to Joplin and copy everything that I have in Joplin and upload that as well. Because I think you know, what this is trying, what I'm trying to do is to show you what kind of note I would be taking if I were taking my own class which is very difficult, okay? Because noticing what is important in my own class that I have been teaching for like 10 years is, is difficult because I know everything already. So finding that difference of, oh, I didn't know this before, this is important, is actually difficult for me, okay? But nonetheless, I'm still trying to make all the key points in my notes here, and then you can check whether you wrote basically the same thing in your notes. Maybe not in exactly the same words or having the same representation, but you need to capture that kind of information when you are taking notes. All right, I'm gonna stop the recorder and just kind of share with you guys one more thing.